Welcome back. This week, we'll have a short lecture. And this lecture will essentially look at using the k-nearest neighbors technique for progression. If you recall, we earlier used the same technique, but we used it for classification. That is, we said there is a set of classes, and we said for a given case, in to which class does the case fall? Or in which class does the case fall? So we used k and n as a classification technique. Now, all we are going to do is to use the exact same technique, of course, with slight modifications for regression. Of course, the distinction between regression and classification is in classification, we are trying to take a case and allocate it to one of a set of predefined classes. For example, given a person with certain demographic information, we want to predict, is this person going to be a buyer or not a buyer? Or given an email, is this a spam email or is it a normal email? Or given a tax return, is this a normal return or is it a fraudulent return? Okay, so all of these examples, of course, we had two classes, but it's possible that you have multiple classes. For example, you might take a car and you might say the price of the car is going to be high, medium or low, where you have defined what high, medium and low mean. Okay, so that is classification. And in regression, what we are talking about is we are trying to predict the value as a number as opposed to just putting something into a class. So for example, we may say what's going to be the price or what is going to be the GDP, right? So the output of regression is a specific number. Of course, you, you know this, we've already used multiple linear regression in our prior modules to predict the SAT scores or the price for a, a Toyota car and so on. So that's really where we are headed. Let us quickly recap what we did with uh, k nearest neighbors for classification, the motivating example. We said there's a, a neighborhood and you've got a bunch of people in the neighborhood, a bunch of households, so to say, and we've associated a color with each household. And here you've got a bunch of households which are Republican and another bunch of households which are Democratic. Okay, so now uh, we've got two cases, two households, A and B, whose political affiliation we do not know. And we are trying to use the k-nearest neighbors technique to find that out. Now, of course, if you look at the general layout of the uh, affiliations and the households, you can clearly see that the top region is predominantly Republican and the bottom region is predominantly Democratic. So simply based on location, we could say that A, is more likely to be a Republican household and B is more likely to be a Democratic household simply because of the location. In other words, we are saying we want to look at the neighbors of a point. In this case, neighbor is actually neighbor because these are all you know, physical, geographically located uh, areas, uh, located households. So we have the geographical location. So we can look at a set of neighbors and say, look, the neighbors of A are predominantly Republican. So it's more likely that A is a Republican than that A is a Democrat. Of course, it's only a likelihood. It's quite possible that A might be Democrat as well, but we're just talking about likelihoods here, right? Uh, of course, you do see that in the top region, there are some Republican Democrats and in the bottom region, there are some Republicans, but we are talking about predominant cases and probabilities. So this is really how the k nearest neighbor technique works. So uh, we have seen all of this already, right? So this is the general idea. But of course, there are some issues involved here. How many neighbors do you want to consider, right? So for example, in this example, I have deliberately put things in such a way that if you considered exactly one neighbor, then the nearest neighbor to A is actually a democratic household, even though predominantly that region is Republican. And similarly, the nearest neighbor to B is actually Republican, whereas the region is predominantly Democratic, right? Uh, of course, this uh, problem would be alleviated if we considered more neighbors. For example, suppose we considered five neighbors away, right? Then you would have four Republicans and only one Democrat. So you could say the probability that A is a Republican is 80% and so on, okay? So that's the idea. So one issue is how many neighbors to consider and of course, if you consider too few neighbors, then you are risking the possibility that you may simply latch on to 
to noise like what we are seeing in this example if you consider too many neighbors then you start losing specificity for example if for a we consider 100 neighbors right then of course you would consider all the points which are here all the households and therefore you lose the specificity or the local characteristics that a smaller value of k would allow you to cap capture so obviously you need to have a balance and if you recall from our earlier discussion with k nearest neighbors on classification we found that basically what we really do is we try out many values of k and find out which value of k performs best on the validation partition and then we use that as our model right so it doesn't mean that you're supposed to commit to a particular value of k up front you can try many different values and choose the one that works best for your particular case and if you have large amounts of data you have the luxury of partitioning you can partition it uh, partition the data into three partitions uh, training validation and test and then look at the try different values of k for the validation partition and then choose the one that you like best and then see how it performs on the test partition this is the method we have employed for k nearest neighbors for classification okay so really what we are going to do is to adopt predominantly the same approach take a point find its neighbors and go based on what the values of the neighbors are okay but of course we've also looked at the fact that because the k nearest neighbors technique considers distance between points and of course this need not necessarily be physical distance in our present example physical distance is fine because you're talking about actual location of houses in a particular neighborhood but you might also be talking about generic concept of distance and we have discussed this a couple of times before so by now you know how exactly to take care of this okay but because this technique deals with distance we need to make sure that all our predictor variables are numeric we cannot have categorical predictor variables because then the calculation of distance becomes impossible okay so you need of course we also know how to take categorical variables and convert them into numerical variables so for example we could use the dummy variable technique which also you've already seen you could do that and then proceed that way another important aspect is because we are dealing with distance we also have to make sure that we don't allow any particular variable to dominate distance calculations and therefore we want to normalize all the predictor variables before we start on our exercise so these are all things that we've already discussed and we've employed in a couple of prior uh, hands-on labs and exercises and so on so i'm sure you understand all this very well okay let's now move on to a specific example okay so here again i have constructed a simple example an example that is suitable for describing the technique of course the data is not realistic and there's obviously not enough data to really talk about this as a data mining technique but our goal here is to explain how the technique works and small is better in that case okay so here uh, the scenario we are considering is let's say there's some sort of a holiday resort and people visit the resort uh, regularly and let's say that our holiday resort has advanced bookings for the next three months so they've already got bookings and what they're trying to do is to really predict what the revenues are going to be for the next couple of months. That is, in other words, of course, the revenue of the resort is going to be simply what the people who live there spend. Okay, so we've got, we know exactly who's going to come to the resort over the next two or three months. Okay, so if we are able to predict how much each of those families is going to spend when they stay in the resort, then we have an idea of the total revenue. So that's really what our resort is trying to do. Uh, now, of course, uh, we assume that the resort has historical information about families that have already visited the resort, stayed there, spent money and so on. Right. So they've got historical information about expenditure patterns of various families. They, they want to use this to create a model to predict expenditure patterns for future families, not patterns, expenditures, actual expenditures of, by future families. But of course, it's possible for us to say 
uh, we've got historical information. Let's identify the average expenditure by a family. So we've got all this information. We can calculate the average. And then based on that, we can predict the future. That is for all the families who are going to come in the future, we can say we're going to have 100 families coming in the next month. Each family spends on the average $600. So our uh, total income is going to be $60,000. We could do that. But what we are trying to say here is that we want an accurate prediction, as accurate a prediction as we can think of, as we can get, because the amount of money that a family spends varies quite a bit, depending upon the income of the family and the family size. That is, uh, let's say you've got a family with a very high income and a low family size, then the per capita spending that they may do, the per person spending, spending they may do, could be much higher than a low income family or a family with many family members. Okay, so of course, we are just being simplistic here and using only these two variables. In reality, we could use many other predictor variables as well. Okay, so let's just pretend that these two variables are adequate for our purpose. Okay, uh, so we don't want to use just the average number. Instead, we want to go by the uh, by something that's a little more accurate. Because for example, let us say that during certain months, you've got a lot of high income people and low family size people who come and during certain other months, the pattern may be quite different, right? So we want to build a model that can work for a lot of these uh, for many different time periods. So we want something that's more accurate. Okay, let's just pretend that that's what we want to do. Okay, so uh, first thing we want to do, of course, is uh, as good data modelers, uh, as good uh, data miners, we understand that KNN is something that uses distance calculations. And therefore, we need to first of all make sure that all the predictor variables, which in our case are income and family size, are both numeric, which is good. They are already numeric. But we also know that uh, unless the variables are scaled, normalized, one of the variables, in this case income, can completely dominate distance calculations. Family size is insignificant compared to the magnitude of income. And therefore, only income differences will play a role in calculating distances. And that's not a great idea. We want both the variables to play a role. And therefore, we need to normalize the variables. So we've done that. I've already done that. And these are the normalized values of the family size and incomes. Of course, from the variable names, you can see that I used uh, our commander to do this. OK, so we've got now the normalized values, and that is what we'll be using to build our k nearest neighbor model. We won't use the original values because of the problems that we mentioned already. So we've got the normalized values. And of course, the first thing we want to do as uh, data miners is to create partitions. And we already know that k nearest neighbor technique requires us to use three partitions. The training and the validation partitions are both used for building the model, which is basically identifying the best value of k. And the test partition is then used to evaluate the quality, objective evaluation of the quality of the model that we have built. Okay, So let's say we've got a training partition with 10 cases, a validation partition with five cases randomly selected, and the test partition with the remaining five cases. That's all our 20 cases. Now, in what follows, I'll just show you how the model is built for different values of k. And once we select the best value of k, testing it, uh, uh, finding the evaluating how that performs on the test, test case, that is trivial. So I will not actually go into it. The hands-on exercise will go into that as well. OK, so we've got our three partitions. And we are now going to look at the process of building the model. And as I've already said, the process of building the model uses the training and the validation partitions. Let's first do k equals 1, which is we're going to consider one neighbor. That's it, the nearest neighbor. k is 1, so we'll consider only one nearest neighbor. And as we did before, we take the first case in the validation partition, which has got a normalized family size of minus 0.987 and a normalized income of minus 1.172. You can see from the data that the actual expenditure for that family was 350. But let's see what the model predicts. 
So to do that, what we have to do is to find the closest point in the training partition to this point. Okay, in other words, we want to consider the family size and income here, family size and income here, calculate the distance from this point, that is minus 0.987 minus 1.17 to calculate the distance from that point to every point in the training partition and select that point which is closest. If you go through the process, you will realize that the closest neighbor happens to be this particular case, which is 0 0.110 and minus 1.366. That's the closest. And uh, therefore, the, the, the spending of that particular case is 450. And in the k nearest tables technique for prediction or regression, what we'll actually do is to take the k nearest neighbors and take the average value of the target variable for those neighbors. In this case, there's only one uh, neighbor and therefore our prediction for this particular case is that expenditure will be 450 because the closest neighbor has an expense of 450. We are considering only one neighbor, remember, because we are doing k equals one and therefore the average is nothing but the value of that neighbor okay so the prediction for this particular case is 450 which we know is off by 100 because the actual expenditure is 350 okay well that's the way the model is okay now let's consider the next case on the validation partition the next case is the second case in the validation partition its closest neighbor happens to be the last case of the training partition and therefore the prediction for this particular case is 525 and that happens to be perfect because the actual value is also 525, which is good. In a similar vein, we continue to find the predictions for the validation partition for every case of the validation partition. And what we find, the values we find are all tabulated here. Okay, so for the first case, we already saw that our prediction is 450. Second case prediction is 525. The third case also the prediction is going to be exact. Even the fourth case, the prediction turns out to be exact. The fifth case prediction turns out to be uh, greater by 90 and so on. Okay, so we've got some predict some cases for which the prediction is exact, two cases for which the prediction is not exact, whatever it is. For every case, we can now find the squared error. Remember, when we are talking about regression, our criterion of performance is the root mean squared error. We've already looked at this in regression. Okay. In classification, our criterion for model quality was the error matrix, whereas here it is the RMS or root mean squared error. So we are now going to try and calculate the root mean squared error for these predictions. Okay. So for every case, we find the squared error. For the first case, the squared error happens to be 10,000. Why? Because the error for that particular case is 100. 450 minus 350 is 100. So the square of that is 10,000. We have that. For the remaining, the next three cases, the error is zero because the prediction and the actual match. And the last case, the difference is 90. So the squared error is 8,100. Okay. So if you add up all the squared errors, you get a total squared error of 18,100. And we can now calculate the root mean squared error, okay? So this is a squared error of 18,100 over five cases. We can now average it out and divide this 18,100 by five to say, this is the squared error per case on the average. And then we take the square root of that, which gives us the root mean squared error, right? So we first find the total squared error, use that to find the mean squared error, take the square root of that to get the root mean squared error. And that root mean squared error happens to be 60.16 in this case. In other words, we can say that on the average, we can expect our prediction to be off by about $60. Sounds like a good number. Okay, so that's our model for k so equals one. So for k equals one, we get, we've got a model that gives an RMS error of 60 approximately. Okay, let's look at now k equals two. For k equals two, we'll not just get the closest neighbor, 
we'll get the two closest neighbors. So once again, let's consider our first case. This is the same old first case that we had considered earlier for k equals one, but this time we're going to find two nearest neighbors. And the two neighbors that turn out happen to be 450 and 510. Okay, so you can already see the error is going to be even greater than what it was earlier. Okay, but now what is the prediction for this particular case? Our prediction is going to be the average of the value of the closest neighbors. So in this case, it's going to be the average of 450 and 510, okay, which happens to be 480. That is going to be the prediction for this particular case. Earlier it was 450, now it's 480. The error has gone up from 1000, uh, from 100 to 130. Okay, let's take the next case, k equals 2 again. We take this case and its closest neighbors are again 450 and 525. And we now take the average of those two as the prediction for this particular case, 450 plus 525 divided by 2, whatever it is. Okay, so in this fashion, we can continue and calculate the uh, predictions for all the cases. And here are the predictions for all the cases. For the first case, the prediction, as we already saw, was 480. Second case was the average of 510 and uh, was 450 and 525. So the average was 487.5. And next case is 752.5 and so on and so on. Okay. So similarly, once again, we calculate the squared errors for each case. That is, we take the difference, square it. So 480 minus 350, 130 squared is 16,900. And here the difference is 525 minus 487.5. Again, square it, you get this difference and so on. So these are all the various squared errors. Again, we calculate the root mean squared error. And for k equal to 2, the RMS error is 90.07. Okay, so we've seen how we calculate the RMS error for a particular value of k. We did it for k equals 1, we did it for k equals 2, and in a similar fashion, we can do it for k equals 3, 4, 5, etc. Okay. In this case, uh, it's most likely that if you keep taking larger values of k, you will probably start getting poorer values. That is, the RMS will keep on increasing. So let's say that for this particular example, our best value of k is actually 1. Okay. Now, in general, what values of k do you try out? There is no hard and fast rule, but typically in k nearest neighbor techniques, we, when you have a large amount of data, you typically try values of k from 1 to about 10, you know, 10, 11, 12. Th that's the uh, level we try out. Beyond that, uh, in k nearest neighbor technique, it's not common to go beyond 10 neighbors. Okay, And most of the time, we'll find that we can do with fewer neighbors uh, than 10. Okay, but this is something you have to experiment with. It could vary from data set to data set, depends on the characteristics. Okay, so now let's say that k equals 1 is our best model. And we want to, and we've got an RMS error of 60. Now, of course, what we would like to say, we'd like to confirm that the RMS error is actually going to be close to 60 even on other cases. So we'll use the test partition and calculate the RMS error for k equals to 1 for the test partition. And that's it. That is how k nearest neighbor technique works for regression. As simple as that. Okay. So now, again, as with other weeks, what you need to do is to go back, uh, look at the hands on lab, carry out the steps on the hands on lab, where I show you that uh, we actually need a new package. We need to install yet another package on top of R. And this is called the FNN package. Our descriptions are all there in the document. Uh, so do that and then do the assignment also that we have posted. Okay, now you'll notice that the assignment actually uses a file, the same file that we use for our hands-on experiment with multiple regression, uh, the Toyota Corolla prizes assignment. So the nice thing is we can now compare the two techniques so far as this particular data set goes, because both can do regression, and therefore we now have two techniques by which we can, we can do regression. So you have an option as well here. Okay, so that's it. I kept the lecture very short. Uh, normally, what I would have done would have been to combine this lecture with our earlier lecture when we did KNN for classification. Uh, but, you know, I didn't want to overload any the lecture for a particular week, give you a lot of time to work on the hands-on and absorb the material. So that's why 
the lecture for this week is pretty short and I think we've gone through the mechanics step by step. You shouldn't have much of a problem understanding it. So I hope you now have, after the hands-on lab and the assignment, uh, I hope you'll have the ability to take this technique and apply it to real life problems.